but thanks to Jonathan and to Samantha and to the rest of the JCCC staff for, for working with me on these lectures. And thanks again to the forward for helping support this and to the Honors College at the University of Houston for all that they've done for me over the years. But most of all, thank you to all of you for being here tonight. It's a dark and stormy night. Um, much more importantly, it's the first night of the NCAA tournament. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you feel, but I would much rather be at a sports bar right now. But um, Butler won today, so I'm happy. Um, I'd like to begin tonight's talk on the Dreyfus Affair by offering a parable. And the parable isn't mine. It's one um, of Isaiah Berlin's, the great Anglo-Jewish essayist and philosopher and conversationalist. Um, and he offers this parallel in a, an essay that he published shortly after the birth of Israel in the early 1950s. In this, par in this parable, he asks the reader to imagine a group of travelers who quite suddenly find themselves in a place facing a strange tribe, a tribe whose customs, whose traditions, whose language they don't know. As for the tribe, their response to these travelers is uncertain. They're not quite sure what to make of them. They don't know whether to welcome these travelers or to kill them. And so these travelers, in order not to be killed, must do everything in their power in order to be welcomed. They need to become as familiar with this tribe as the people of this tribe are they themselves. Now, of course, those born into the tribe don't have to do this. It comes naturally. The way in which they eat, the way in which they speak, the way in which they pray, the way in which they see the world, they were born, they were taught to do it that way. It's part of their ethos. It's quite natural. But these strangers, these travelers, it's not natural. They must be hyper aware of what this tribe does, how it acts in the world. They have to be acutely conscious of these activities. They need to get it right. Their survival depends upon it. And so they study, they observe, they rehearse the ways and manners of the tribe. And eventually, they come to know the tribe better than the tribe knows themselves. Now, over time, this effort to learn about the tribe, to know it through and through, leads to a sense of identification with the tribe. Not only do the travelers become specialists of the tribe, but in some fundamental sense, they go native themselves. They think they become members of the tribe. But this is what they want to believe. It's not true. The natives, at least, don't think it's true. They may admire these travelers, for their intelligence. They may respect them for the acuity of their perceptions and the, the smoothness of their performances and their rehearsals. They never, ever mistake the travelers for fellow native tribesmen. Why is that? And this is where Berlin begins to, to, to tease this parable out. For him, this is the tragic dimension to the story. The travelers are too aware. They're too expert. They are too well-versed in the tribe. And at the same time, they're too critical of their own relationship with the tribe. They're too conscious of their effort to blend in. They're too aware of their effort to be just like them. But at the very same time, they're too critical of what makes these natives tick. Now, when things are going well, the travelers are the best exponents, the best explainers, the best defenders 
of the tribe. But when things go sour, and inevitably things will go sour sooner or later, the travelers become the tribe's foremost critics. They cannot relax this critical spirit okay, in their approach to the world and to this tribe. And so it's not terribly surprising, Berlin goes on, that at moments like these, the tribe will turn on the travelers. And this astonishes the travelers because they thought they were members of the tribe. And this proves to be their fatal mistake. They dress like the natives, they talk like them, they eat like them, they act like them, yet, and here I quote Berlin, they lack something, want of which prevents them from being natives. What that something is, no one can precisely specify. Nevertheless, it is there, and the stranger's anxiety to deny it merely attracts further attention to their unnative conduct." End of quote. And this becomes even more manifest because the one thing these travelers will not surrender is their religion. All the while denying, stoutly denying, that this attachment to their religion in any way serves as an obstacle to being fully one with the tribe. Now this for Isaiah Berlin is the fate of the Jew in the modern West. It's the fate of the German Jew. It's the fate of the English Jew. It's the fate of the American Jew. And it is the fate of the French Jew. It is the fate of Alfred Dreyfus, who's the subject in some sense of tonight's lecture. I want to keep this parable in mind, for all of us to keep it in mind. And we'll return to it periodically over the course of the lecture to see the way in which this parable in many ways reflects the predicament of Captain Alfred Dreyfus, um, but also the predicament of French Jewry at the end of the 19th century in France. And if Berlin is right, reflects the predicament of Jews in Europe and in North America. Now we need to turn to our story, and it's an amazing story. It's a complicated story, and I have edited it. And there's no way that I can tell the story in full um, and keep this lecture under an hour, which I promised Jonathan I would do in order to leave time for questions, which we really didn't have last time we met, okay? Now the story begins in a trash can. In late September of 1894, a woman by the name of Marie Bastien was rummaging in the waste paper basket of Maximilian von Schwarzenkoppen. Schwarzenkoppen was the military attache at the German embassy in Paris. Now, Marie Bastien had a keen interest in trash, not just because she was a cleaning woman. Is the sound coming in and out now? It is. Oh, no, it's still okay. I'll stay over here, okay? Um, so Marie Bastion was not just a cleaning woman. She was, in fact, a spy in the pay of the French intelligence services. And it was her job on a nightly basis to go through the trash of the military attache in Paris. On this particular night, she finds several shredded pieces of paper all belonging to the same page in the, trash pa in the trash paper basket. She collects these pieces and brings them to what is called the Statistical Bureau, which was the very anodyne name for the French intelligence service in the Third Republic. The officials at the Statistical Bureau tape these pieces back together again. And what do they discover? It's a letter in which the writer is offering for sale a number of military secrets, French military secrets, to the Germans. 
most disturbingly, one of the secrets up for sale is news about a new cannon <laughs> that's being developed by the French military, a 120 meet, um, um, millimeter cannon. As a consequence, the, officer, the officers at the Statistical Bureau concluded that the document had to be the work of an artillery officer. Who else would know about this? And they also thought or concluded that this artillery officer had to be privy to all of the other secrets that were for sale on this memorandum. And the memorandum is called the bordereau, okay, the French word for it. And so they concluded that this officer must be a member of the army general staff. So they begin to review all of the officers on the general staff and they discover an artillery officer. Better yet, he was an officer who was detested by his fellow officers. He was detested because of his brilliance. He graduated top of his class at the Ecole Polytechnique, which is one of the top, it's one of the great grands écoles in France where they train engineers. He graduated top of his class at the Ecole, Milita uh, at the Ecole de Guerre, the war school in Paris. He was detested because of his formality. He was detested because of the distance he kept from his peers. Best of all, he was detested because he was a Jew. He was the only Jew then serving on the general staff. Now this is no small matter in a profession, the military, that was steeped in anti-Semitism. To boot, he wasn't just any Jew, he was an Alsatian Jew. And being Alsatian, he was naturally suspected of German sympathy. Now, as you no doubt have guessed, this officer was Alfred Dreyfus. Now what I'd like to do is take you back more or less to the time this occurs. Um, I'm about to show you one of a few film clips of a silent movie that was made in 1899 by Georges Méliès. For those of you who have seen Hugo, you know who Georges Méliès is. Um, he's one of the, in the first generation of French filmmakers, movie directors, along with the Lumiere brothers, he basically invents the art. Georges Méliès was not just a magician and a filmmaker, he was also an ardent Dreyfusard. Um, and he made a series of shorts of Dreyfus's experience from this moment in 1894 to 1899 and the second trial. And I'd like to show you the first clip. It runs about a minute. What have we just seen? Um, exactly. On October 15th, Alfred Dreyfus was summoned to the Ministry of War. Um, and he was asked by the commanding officer in that scene, whose name, a very unlikely name, of Armand Mercier du Paty de Clam. 
pretended that his writing hand was injured, and he asked Dreyfus to sit down at the table at his desk and to take a dictation. Halfway through the dictation, um, Du Petit de Clam brings the, se the, the, uh, the seance to a, to a hall and says, Captain Dreyfus, your hand is trembling. Why? Okay, and Dreyfus replied, because it's cold in here, Commandant. And he said, no, it's because you are afraid. And he had him arrested. And he accused him there and then of high treason. He was kept in prison for two weeks in Paris. He was unable to see his wife, Lucie. He was unable to see a lawyer. He was unable to see the evidence that was held against him. He was woken at all hours during those two weeks. He had bright lights shown in his face. He was ordered arbitrarily to stand and then to sit repeatedly. And through it all, Dreyfus maintained his innocence, that he was not the author of the Bordereau, of this memorandum that you're looking at. Now, he was quite calm during his interrogation. He had that same cold demeanor that put him in such bad odor with his fellow officers. But when he was brought back to his cell and locked inside, he would bang his head against the door and against the walls. He would shriek in agony, claiming his innocence and demanding to see his wife and his children. He had two young children, a boy and a girl. And his jailer, extraordinarily sympathetic character by the name of Ferdinand Forzanetti. Forzanetti feared that Dreyfus was going to take his life, and so he was always under observation. Ultimately, the French army wished that Dreyfus had taken his life, and we'll understand the reasons why momentarily. The following month, he's brought in front of a court-martial, a military, military tribunal. This is on December 19th, and it lasts just three days. By now, uh, Dreyfus has a lawyer, a brilliant lawyer by the name of Edgar Demange. Demange was convinced that he would have Dreyfus acquitted. Why? Because there was just one piece of evidence, the Bordereau, the memorandum. And there were as many experts studying it who said this was not Dreyfus's handwriting as there were experts who insisted it was. In fact, the most convincing expert, the one who said that it was, in fact, Dreyfus's handwriting, he was a lunatic by the name of Alphonse Bertillon. And Bertillon made this extraordinarily convoluted case that the very reason Dreyfus's handwriting during that session with Dupati de Clam did not resemble that of the memorandum was because he was deliberately trying to hide it. And he adduced all of these scientific reasons as he explained this to the uh, military officers. Though Demange thought he would get his client off, he hadn't bargained with the determination of the army to convict Dreyfus. The memorandum, along with other sheets of incriminating evidence that really weren't incriminating at all, that were in part invented by the men in the Statistical Bureau, um, were presented to the, to the military judges. And Demange was not allowed to see many of these documents. In fact, he wasn't even told about the existence of a number of these documents. And if I'm coming down heavily on these items, um, it's for reasons that I'll return to at the very end of tonight's talk. At one point, his chief accuser in the Statistical Bureau, a man by the name of Joseph Henry, Joseph Henry declared under oath that he knew Dreyfus was guilty. He had been told that by somebody else, and at a dramatic moment in the trial, he pointed to Dreyfus and said, voici le traître. 
Okay, here is the traitor. And then when he was asked by Demange, how did he know this? Henri pointed to his head and said, there are things inside the head of an officer that even his capi doesn't know, the military cap that the officers wore. And so these sinister illusions, these clear warnings about national security, that the nation was in danger, convinced the military tribunal that Dreyfus was, in fact, guilty. Now, since France had abolished the death penalty in 1848 for cases of treason during peacetime, the best they could do was sentence him to life imprisonment. But before they did that, they had to go through a certain ritual. And that was the public humiliation of an officer broken of his rank. In early January of 1895, we're in 1895 now, and this is an illustration from one of the, um, the, uh, the penny papers of the era, Le Petit Parisien. You see Dreyfus, his sword being broken, his epaulets, his buttons, his insignia, all of those have already been torn off. He was marched into the courtyard. You really can't make out the crowd. But there was a crowd outside the courtyard that while the ceremony was taking, bless, taking place, were hurling, shrieking, Judas, traitor, death to the Jew. Now, what I want to do is let Maurice Barrez, one of the players as well as observers of the affair, describe what happened. An officer of the guard, terrible in size and magnificent in uniform, stripped him so quickly and yet so slowly of his buttons, braids, epaulets, red trouser stripes, pulling him about, tearing at him, till he finally looked as if he were in mourning black. The most terrible moment was when he broke the saber on his knee. Now, what the crowd shrieking for Dreyfus's death didn't know, and what Maurice Barrez didn't know, is that the night before, the epaulets, the buttons, the braids, the insignia were all loosened so that they could be torn off easily. The saber was broken the night before and then soldered back together so that it would break easily over the knee of this magnificent officer, magnificent and terrible in size. The spectacle of this public humiliation had to be edifying. It didn't matter if it was authentic. The only authentic elements to this event was the passion of the crowd, its hatred of the Jews, or at least of this Jew. The other authentic element was Dreyfus, who during the entire episode, time and again, affirmed in a clear voice, I am innocent. A month later, he's loaded onto a ship in southern France at La Rochelle, um, and he is packed off to serve his sentence. He could not be executed, but where he is sent to spend the rest of his life was, in fact, a death sentence. It was Devil's Island off the coast of French Guiana in the Atlantic. Now, French Guiana had itself, over the course of the 19th century, become a penal colony, political prisoners, common criminals, and the like. It was a hellish place, but it was at least a place where you could share your hell with family members. Wives could accompany their husbands and live in bungalows or barracks that were built on the coast. Now, French Guiana, the mainland, was, was club med in comparison to this heat-blasted and malarial rock off its coast, Devil's Island. This was to be Dreyfus's residence for the next four and a half years. 
it was a devil's island that ships either bound for French Guiana or on their way back to the continent, the European continent. If they had cases of smallpox or typhus, this is where they would spend their quarantine at Devil's Island. It was here that a special cabin inside this very narrow palisade was built for Dreyfus. The only other inhabitants of this rock in the ocean were five gods who observed him continuously and were forbidden to speak to him. Here are two other views. Um, here's yet, um, this is from the Petit Journal, um, an illustration, an image d'Epinal, as they were known, of Dreyfus at the Palisade. And here is a present day photograph of the uh, hut uh, in which, uh, to which uh, he was um, sentenced. I should mention that all these images are from the Wikipedia entry <laughs> to the Dreyfus <laughs> affair. The, the only ones where I don't, we don't have copyright issues. Um, so, uh, thank goodness for Wikipedia. Um, just a year later, after he first arrived in Devil's Island, rumors began to circulate that he was going to be rescued. There was a rescue, a rescue attempt afoot to spring him from his prison on Devil's Island. 
Um, and of course, a ship was going to arrive. The ship was in the pay of Jews. Um, and as a consequence, the, uh, the, the prison warden of uh, Devil's Island ordered that every night that Dreyfus be shackled to his bed. He was wearing irons while he slept. Um, and I want you to think about these shackles. I'll return to this once again at the end of the lecture. Um, and that the prisoners, I mean, or that the guards, forgive me, the guards were ordered should a ship appear off the coast of the island, they were ordered to blow Dreyfus's brains out without hesitation. And so Dreyfus's life came to an end at Devil's Island, at least for four and a half years. And I think this is a good place where we, for just a moment or two, should come to an end as well and think about all of this. I want to break off the narrative for just a moment. Now, as I was thinking about it for tonight, two thoughts came to me. I'll share the second one at the end of the talk. The first one, and forgive me if this sounds glib, but I can't help think about Downton Abbey. I don't know how many of you have been watching this. Um, but specifically, I've been thinking about Mr. Bates. Mr. Bates is pursued by an irrational, hate-filled foe, his wife. He's unjustly charged and found guilty of her murder. He just avoids the death penalty and is locked away for life in a grim prison. His sole connection to the world is his second wife, Anna, who moves heaven, earth, and the Granthams to prove her husband innocent. Now, in Dreyfus's case, he has an Anna. That woman is Lucy Hadamach. Uh, that was her um, maiden name. Um, and unlike Anna, Lucy cannot visit Dreyfus. She's prevented from doing so. She couldn't accompany him, though she wanted to desperately, to Devil's Island. But like Anna, she writes to him and writes to him and writes to him, though sometimes, as in the case of Downton Abbey, those letters are kept from the recipient to torture him. And like Anna, Lucy moves heaven and earth to free her husband. And she does this in the company of Dreyfus's brother, Matthew, Matthew Dreyfus. They work tirelessly to gather evidence, to enlist powerful advocates, and we'll talk about it in a moment, um, and to write these letters to Dreyfus, reminding him of her love and her conviction that he is innocent. But there is an important difference. Unlike Anna and Mr. Bates, the Dreyfus family has immense financial means. In fact, much like the Granthams, thanks to, Cor thanks to Cora Lewinson's money. They also have, like the Granthams, a grand style of life, the Dreyfuses. They have this remarkable apartment in the fashionable district of the 16th Avenue on the Avenue de Trocadero. They have a set of servants. They have a stable with horses. In fact, Alfred Dreyfus, every morning, takes, his ho takes a horse for its exercise in the Bois de Boulogne. Now, I mention this parallel first because it, it's, I like being glib. <laughs> but more importantly, it points to two other things worthy of mention. First, it reminds us of the intense human drama of the Dreyfus Affair, and we often lose sight of it. We think that this is an affair about politics, about ideas, about intellectuals, about artists, the fate of a nation, when in fact, for four and a half years, a man is removed from time, he's removed from history, he's removed from his family, unjustly.
And so we should keep that in mind. Second, and no less important in a way, it points to a parallel that we see in Downton Abbey and in the Dreyfus Affair. There are, that they're more or less contemporaneous. And it's at this point, at the turn of the 20th century, that vast changes are afoot. And they are cracking open the traditional societies of Great Britain and of France. Now, what do I mean? In Downton Abbey, the Granthams are playing cricket on the edge of a volcano one that's been gathering its forces for years before 1914 and the First World War. Capitalism, globalization, bourgeois values, working class demands, all of these things and more are colliding against and collapsing the world the Granthams once knew. This is also the case in Fond de Sieg, France. You have mass democracy, you have mass culture, you have mass consumerism you have mass confusion. People have a hard time finding their feet in the world wrought by modernity. Where do we stand? For those harmed by these changes, economic changes, social changes, industrial changes, for those who feel threatened by these changes, they have an urgent need for an answer. Why are the banks failing as they are in the 1880s? Why did the Panama Canal Company go belly up as it did in the 1880s? Why are small shops shutting their, closing their shutters as they are? It's an epidemic in the 1880s and 1890s as big department stores begin to move in in Paris and the provinces. Why are jobs, traditional jobs, ever more scarce? The answers, the real answers, are too complex. As a consequence, they're too unsatisfying for those who are posing these questions. They need a simple answer. And what is that simple answer? The Jew. The Jew provides the answer. The Jew is the key to all of these changes. The Jew is the emblem. The Jew is the vehicle. The Jew is the agent of modernity, for good and for bad, at the turn of the century. And this spells a change in the very nature of anti-Semitism. And it's a change that has as its first victim there are others, but the first notable victim, Alfred Dreyfus. It's no longer the traditional anti-Jewish sentiment of, say, the Catholic Church over the course of the millennium. Instead, by the end of the 19th century and the changes we've talked about, it has morphed into an ism. It's an ideology. It's a bundle of ideas often contradicting one another that pretend to explain why things were the way they were and also prescribe a method for changing them, how we can once again master our lives and our world. Again, for modern anti-Semitism, and we see its birth in France, for modern anti-Semitism, the Jew is the key to all of this. The Jew is cosmopolitan. He's wandering and rootless. The Jew is adept at the abstract and critical skills necessary to sort of surf the changes of this new age. The Jew, of course, has embraced these very isms. Why? Because it has liberated him or her. Republicanism. Liberalism. And these isms have invited the Jews to assimilate. And of course, if we go back to Berlin's parable, the more they try to assimilate, the more they become suspect. 
This at least is the argument of perhaps the most famous, the most influential, the most powerful anti-Semite of the late 19th century, a man by the name of Edouard Drummond, Edward Drummond. In 1888, Drummond publishes a two-volume work <laughs> called <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> in 1888, Drummond publishes a two-volume work called La France Juive, Jewish France. It is a bestseller. In its first year, it sells more than 100,000 copies. And it goes through several more editions to the end of the 19th century and past the 19th century, I should, I, I should mention. In this work, Jewish France, Drummond describes a history of conflict between two peoples. And this is a scientific approach between the Aryans and the Semites. And in this war between Aryans and Semites, according to Drummond, the Semites, the Jews, are so formidable, they're so threatening because they, we, because we are changelings. We are chameleons. Not only do we inhabit the world of finance and the world of industry, but we also form the ranks, the rabble of those exotic and foreign peoples coming from the East and arriving in France because of its Republican promise. Not only do we direct the publishing houses, the universities, and the arts in France, but we are also the theoreticians of those forces that want to overthrow all of this for a socialist future. In a word, for Drummond, the Jews can't lose. We're everywhere. We have all of our bases covered. Whereas the France, of Clo the France of Clovis, of Charlemagne, of Joan of Arc, of the Capetians, of the Bourbons, that France cannot win unless it acknowledges the threat and acts upon it. Hence the need for his book. And then with the success of his book, he establishes a newspaper that plays a pivotal role in the Dreyfus Affair. The newspaper's name is La Libre Parole, Free Speech. We'll talk a bit more about that if we have the time. We don't have the time. I'm already. Um, and so this rise of this new kind of anti-Semitism partly explains the importance of the Dreyfus Affair. A second important element to the Dreyfus Affair is the rise of something else. It is the rise of the intellectual. But in order to talk about the intellectuals, we have to return to the story. So let me do that very, very quickly. I'm going to start speaking really fast. Between 1895 and 1898, Matthew Dreyfus, Lucy Dreyfus, mobilize an increasing number of politicians, of writers, artists, academics, journalists, to review the evidence that had been brought against Alfred Dreyfus in order to demand a new trial. And doubts are increasingly pervasive. People are now asking, what was this all about? Can it be true? And so you have, among the early Dreyfusards, those who insist upon a trial, a new trial, and insist upon Dreyfus's innocence, you have people like Bernard Lazare, who was a symbolist poet, an anarchist from the southern city of Nîmes. In fact, his birth name is Lazare Bernard. And he reverses it when he goes to Paris in order to win fame and fortune as a poet. And then he becomes an anarchist. He's approached by the Dreyfuses. And he takes up the case. And he realizes that the evidence brought against Dreyfus by the military is pocked with holes. 
It simply doesn't stand. And in 1896, he publishes a book called A Judicial Era, which is the first blow against the military and their case against Dreyfus. There are yet others. I don't have the time to talk about them. But let me briefly make mention of one, because in many ways, he's become the star. Not Alfred Dreyfus, but this man has become the star, so much so that in the movie that was made in the 1980s, have I lost my sound? Oh, OK. I'm sorry. Um, um, in a movie that was made in the early 80s, I believe, directed by Ken Russell, The Dreyfus Affair, Richard Dreyfus stars in it, <laughs> but not as Dreyfus. He stars as Colonel Georges Picard. Okay. Georges Picard takes over the Statistical Bureau after Dreyfus is packed off to Devil's Island. What does he discover? <laughs> there are still secrets. Um, 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 that are making their way to the German military attache. Clearly, Dreyfus was not the man. And he goes to his superior, a man by the name of General Gunz, to tell him about his discovery. And, a, and I need to add that Picard was also an Alsatian, but he was a Catholic. And not only was he a Catholic Alsatian, he was anti-Semitic. And yet, he sees this evidence, and he's appalled. He goes to General Gunz, and here's the conversation that he later records. He tells him about his suspicions, and Gunz replies, what can it matter to you whether the Jew remains on Devil's Island or not? And Picard replies, but he's innocent. Gunz, if you say nothing, nobody will ever know. Picard, what you've said, General, is abominable. I will not carry the secret with me to the grave. But he did carry it with him to the deserts of Tunisia. He was immediately ordered to a desert outpost by the military high command, which is where he spent the next year. Perhaps the most famous intellectual is Emile Zola the great novelist, the creator of the Rougon Maca series. Um, and as a novelist, Zola was captive. He was mesmerized, mesmerized by the story when he was approached by Bernard Lazare and by Matthew Dreyfus. It captured, it captured a sense of tragedy, of tragic storytelling. Let me quote him here. What a gripping tragedy and what amazing protagonists. Faced with these documents of such tragic beauty, my novelist's heart leaps in passionate admiration. But at the very same time, his republicanism, his sense of being a French, republicanism, a French Republican, is outraged. He is appalled by this miscarriage of justice. And he writes to his wife, the affair throws me into a rage that makes my hands tremble. I wish to widen the debate to make it an enormous affair of humanity and justice. And so these two elements, the novelistic and the moral, combine. And they transform Emile Zola into his age's Voltaire. Or as his critics disparagingly refer to him as an intellectual. <laughs> Something to keep in mind is that when the term is coined by Maurice Barrez. It's pejorative. Barrez wants to know what is it that allows these writers and these academics to claim this moral ascendancy? Because of their skills as an artist or as a sociologist? Actually, it's an interesting question, one that we can talk about. And so in his effort to widen the debate, what Zola does on January 4th, 1898, is he transforms the affair with a small a into the affair with a capital A. He publishes in the newspaper that was edited by the great Republican politician, Georges Clemenceau. He publishes, oh, yeah, it's this thing, right? Oh, that's Picard. I'm sorry, I forgot all about him. 
it looks like Richard Dreyfuss. <laughs> he publishes perhaps the greatest work of polemics in, in, in at least in, 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 West, in French literature, Jacques Hughes. And what he does, paragraph by paragraph, he accuses everybody, beginning with the president, Felix Faure, to politicians, to the generals, to the military tribunal, of having deliberately railroaded this man, adducing evidence for his claims. It is a remarkable work. And he concludes, I do not know the people I accuse. I've never seen them. And I feel against them neither spite nor hatred, which is not true. He does, but that's neither here nor there. What I am doing here is simply making a revolution to hasten the explosion of truth and justice. And the lead motif in this article, Jacques Hughes, is truth marches on. And it does in this case. With the publication of Jacques Hughes, France erupts in anti-Semitic riots. Uh, here's one. Um, I'm not even sure where this is taking place. Montmartre. Okay, this is in Paris. How did you read that from here? I, I know. Anyway. Um, um, and for his pains, Zola is, is accused of libel. And he is hauled into court and found guilty. And he has to flee France for his life. And you have a sense of, of the passions aroused that Zola is questioning the honor of the army the integrity of the army, and a certain understanding of France. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. By 1898, okay, with the publication of Jacques Hughes and the transformation of the affair into the affair, France is divided into two nations. You have the Dreyfusards, you have the anti-Dreyfusards. The Dreyfusards, to put it very simply, simplistically, that's all I had the time for, they are motivated by the cause of truth and justice. In fact, they often forget about Dreyfus himself. For them, the true France is the France that is brought into being in 1789, the one that we talked about when we last met. And that it is the very future of this France depends upon a new trial um, and the finding of Dreyfus innocent at this trial. The other camp, the anti-Dreyfusards, and they had their intellectuals too. And they saw a very different France, one that wasn't based on abstractions, but instead was based on what Maurice Barrez once again called la terre et les morts the earth and the dead. That one can be, and think again of Berlin's parable. Barrez argues, and this argument imbues one of his greatest novels called Les Déracinés, The Uprooted. That being French means generation after generation, working the same plots of land, living in the same village or in the same region, having an ancestry that, that, that goes back to time immemorial, being one with the earth and having one's ancestors buried in that earth. That it was not abstract, it was real, it was material, it was organic. And that the army, especially after the humiliation defeat of 1870, the army represented this France. It doesn't really matter, Barrez argued, if Dreyfus is innocent. He's unimportant. What is important is safeguarding the reputation and honor of the army of this particular France. Now, while all of this is taking place, and we can talk more about it during the answering question and answer period, um, 
I'm telling you, that's what professors do. It's answer and question periods. <laughs> anyway, um, um, while all this is happening, the subject, the ostensible subject of this affair, Dreyfus, is absolutely ignorant. He has no inkling of what's happening back in France. And then in the middle of 1899 in June, he receives a telegram. He is ordered back from Devil's Island to France to stand a new trial. Um, And here he is landing. This is the last film clip. It's wonderful, if only because of the special effects. Recall he was a magician, Melies. He's landing at Quiberon, which is a port um, in the western province of Brittany. And we have to recall that he has just suffered four and a half years of solitary confinement. Bouts of malaria and the like. A second trial is held, a second military tribunal, and he's found guilty again, but with extenuating circumstances. Um, and this occurs on September 9th, 1899. Ten days later, on the 19th of September, 1899, the new French president, the, the, the previous president, Félix Faure, who was an anti dreyfusard did not want the revision, a new trial. Happily, he had a heart attack. Less happily, he had it in the arms of his mistress at the Elysee Palace. Um, and he was replaced by Émile Lubet, um, a Republican of the center left, who wanted a revision. So on the 19th of September, Dreyfus's lawyers go to him, and Lubey agrees to sign a pardon in order to put all of this behind France. Now, um, it's already 25 to 9. What I'd like to do before I turn to all of you, and we can have a conversation about all of this, um, is, is return to my second thought. I told you I had two thoughts um, as I was preparing for tonight. The first, Downton Abbey. Um, a miserable thought. Okay, but there's a second thought, and it's far more serious. Um, um, and um, it's a provocative one. Um, it's not mine. Um, it's Louis Bagley's. Um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Louis Bagley. Um, a remarkable novelist, um, German-born, um, lived in the States for 50, 60 years, German Jew. Um, <laughs> who for the first 35 or 40 years of his life was a remarkably successful lawyer um, in New York um, while writing novels, and now he's turned to it full time. Two years ago, Louis Bagley published a work, Why the Dreyfus Affair Matters, with Yale University Press. Um, actually, it was more than two years ago. It was um, about three or four years ago because he wrote it shortly after President Obama's election in 2008. And Bagley, in writing this book, could not help but think about the parallels between Dreyfus's experience and what is taking place at Guantanamo, um, and what took place during the eight years of the Bush presidency. And I realize I may be provoking some, but I think that's a good thing. Um, and what I'd like to do is just read one passage from Bagley's work. And we'll finish there. Will there be in that generation the one that follows the second war in Iraq? And, what, what, and I mention this too because in the New York Times today uh, there was a story that there are now 25 prisoners at Gitmo who are engaged in a hunger strike. Um, and they're being force fed. Um, having said that, let me read from Bagley's book. Um, will there be in that generation men and women ready to defend human rights and the dignity of every human life, 
against abuse wrapped in the claims of expediency and reasons of state. Dreyfusards, Emile Zola, Jean Jaurès, Anatole France, to cite only the best known, and Lieutenant Colonel Georges Picard, who ultimately became Dreyfus's savior. They gave the answer for France at the turn of the 19th century. Journalists dedicated to exposing the abuses of the Bush administration, members of the federal judiciary, upholding the rule of law, military lawyers who have put their careers at risk by taking a stand against torture and kangaroo trials, and civilian lawyers and law professors of all ages who have devoted thousands of hours without pay as legal defenders of Guantanamo, det Guantanamo detainees, have given the answer for the United States. They have redeemed the honor of the nation. It's 20 to 9. I went on too long. I'll end here, and let me turn things over to you. <laughs> yes? Could you tell us about the character of the Catholic Church and the Catholic newspapers? Oh, they were toxic. Oh, I'm sorry. The question. Oh, Jonathan? Sorry. Would you tell us about the attitude of the Catholic Church at that time and the Catholic newspapers? Uh, the Catholic Church um, um, uh, was pleased by these events, um, and um, um, though the church itself didn't speak as a body, um, you did find certain orders, like the Assumptionists, who were virtually anti-Semitic as an order, uh, much more so than, say, the Jesuits or the, Franci or the Franciscans in France. But there were papers, Catholic papers, most importantly, most notoriously, La Croix, the cross, uh, which along with free speech, la libre parole, uh, was one of the most um, um, uh, vitriolic, one of the most toxic of anti-Semitic news organs um, in the 1890s. Having said that, La Croix still exists, and it is one of the most remarkable newspapers today. They've come full circle. Um, it's a it's, it's a newspaper, a Catholic paper, that is devoted to issues of social justice, of dialogue between Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and um, they, they've confronted their past. Yes? I'd like to go to the, the parable. Uh, we read some of, of anti-Semitic acts in, in France, and it told that most of the, or virtually all of the anti-Semitic acts in France are the work of, uh, of, of Muslims in France. What is the, the attitude of a French people in France today? Do they view this as that's just some, a matter of concern within that tribe, or do, do, do the French real view this as being implications for France itself? Um. It's a huge question. It's one that I plan on taking up in my last lecture. Um, um, so, um, but it's a big question. And you know, I'm, a, I'm from New York. I, I, I really can't speak for France. Um, um, but um, you know, many of my friends in France are extremely, my, 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 my Gentile friends are very troubled by this. Uh, my Jewish friends are no less troubled. There is a spate. There is, there, there, um, there, there's a rise in anti-Semitic acts in France. Uh, the statistics, in fact, there was a piece just yesterday. Um, 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 I think it was in the Times about that. And um, it was in Le Monde, that I know. And um, let's hold off on that until when I think of something really in intelligent to say, OK, <laughs> in the fourth lecture. Yes? How did the German press relate to the Dreyfus affair, and were there other spies on the French or, or on the German side, and was there an exchange of spies? Well, there were spies. In fact, the real spy, the guilty, par the gu the guilty party in the case of the Bordereau was a man by the name of Armand Valsen Estahazi, who came from an old Hungarian family. He was a ne'er-do-well, he was a party animal, he was always in debt, um, and he was the one who wrote the Bordereau. Um, um, 
And he only admitted that when he was safely in exile in England. Um, in fact, there was a court martial of Esterhazy, and he was immediately acquitted by the court martial. Uh, which is one of the things that prodded Zola. That happened two weeks before the publication of Jacques, by the way. Um, of course, spying was everyday business. Um, what's interesting is that Schwarzkopen was very sympathetic to Dreyfus. He knew that Dreyfus was being railroaded. But for those of you, who, you, might, you might be aware that the entire um, archive for the, for the Dreyfus Affair is now public. <coughs> the Ministry of War in France has made it. You can access it. And one of the things that has come out is that Schwarzkopen was having a, li a liaison, a relationship with the Italian military attaché, Panizzati. They were lovers. And because of that, and the letters in which Schwarzkopen is telling Panizzati, you know, it's not Dreyfus. They couldn't be, they, they didn't want them to be made public. So, I mean, all of these, made, only Zola can invent these in one of his novels, right? <laughs> so, Jonathan. Uh, was Dreyfus, you say he was pardoned, was he ever, did they ever admit he was innocent? 1906. Mm -hmm. And what about Zola? Was he Jewish? No. no. And what he was, of, he, his family was of Italian descent. And what happened to him? He died in 1902, um, um, and he died of asphyxiation. The chimney in his apartment was blocked. To this very day, there are those who insist that it was deliberately blocked by those who um, 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 wanted to avenge um, his victory. I just want to know what happened to Dreyfus you know, in later years. What he was, he, he, he was, he was, he was um, um, formally found innocent in 1906. He was returned to the rank of captain. Um, and during the First World War, he was responsible, or one of the, one of the officers responsible for looking, um, um, looking to the defenses of Paris during the war. And he lived until 1935. He stayed in France. This is one of the fascinating things. And again, this brings us back to Isaiah Berlin's parable. He wanted to be accepted. He went back to that very institution that had made his life absolute agony for five years. He saw himself as an officer, a French military officer. Why wouldn't he go back? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. I, I, I'm not criticizing him. I, I, this, this, it says something about, about this deep desire on the part of French Jews to be French. Yeah, I, I just wonder for Dreyfus, um, he was known to be Jewish, and it was not usual for Jews to reach such a rank even before the trial. How would you explain that he reached the rank that he... Uh, Attained for the right. Well, there are two things. There, 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 the answer is twofold. First, there were several officers, Jewish officers, who had served in the high command and who had high ranks elsewhere in the military. In fact, one of them, Armand Meyer, challenged a notorious anti Semite by the name of Edmund de Morez to a duel for an anti Semitic slur, and he was killed in the duel. But I'm mean, not Morez, but Meyer was killed in a duel. Um, and it was just one of many duels that Jewish officers fought in the 1880s and the 1890s. Um, um, affairs of honor against anti-Semitic uh, peers in the army. Um, but how did he get there, and how did these other Jews get there? Because France took its Republican credo seriously. This was the greatness, and this remains the greatness of France. It was based on merit. And this is what so teed off his colleagues who made their way up because of connections or because of um, 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 aristocratic backgrounds. <coughs> Alfred Dreyfus, along with his fellow Jewish officers, made it that high because 
he was admitted into the best schools. He, you know, slam dunked those, those courses, those schools, and he earned his officer stripes. And uh, what better way to prove your patriotism than by serving in that body, that guild, that most, most clearly um, you know, reflected or embodied you know, the nation, the army. Yeah. Yes, of course. Not only was he the grand rabbi, he actually married he Alfred was, and Lucy. He was, that was the first wedding that he performed as the uh, uh, grand rabbi. Uh, 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 can you give me the microphone, Jonathan? And I have pictures of the family uh, get together from uh, 1912 at uh, Zado Khan's country estate outside of Paris where there wasn't a, the sun and the moon were going together <laughs> and uh, an eclipse of the sun. And uh, there are 60 some odd people there. I have a, a copy of the family photograph and the code that defines all 60 people. I'd and, love to see that. And, uh, Alfred and Lucy are there, as is Lucy's brother, who also married into the family. He did. And he was a Nobel Prize winner in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've had a very... Uh, if That's an extraordinary story. I have a lot of information. I have copies from the archives and... Uh, can we talk board? after and so you can yes. give me your name and contact information? I, 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 I wanted, to, wanted to invite you to come to my place and look at my... 18 volumes of loose leaf. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Let, 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 let's talk right after this, okay? Thank you. Just wanted to ask, what became of the Dreyfus family? Well, Were they um, killed in the Holocaust? There, um, actually, one of Dreyfus's daughters was in the resistance. Um, um, his daughter, is it his daughter or is it his niece? His granddaughter. His granddaughter? His daughter, and uh, she was actually sent to Medinek or to, uh, I can't recall, but no, she actually died. One of the women's, uh, right. French, French, uh, army. Right, she was in, in, in one of the resistance movements. Um, um, I don't, it, some of them have survived. Um, um, actually, Lucy um, 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 went to the unoccupied zone. Um, and she managed to survive more or less in hiding, and she lived until 1945. Um, and she died soon after the, um, uh, France's liberation. My grandfather was on his patrol every day on the square with a tall box over it. Jonathan, you want to? Uh, my uh, grandfather put tefillin on every day, saying his prayers, and... Uh, especially for the Paul of Alfred, the poor Alfred. Really? And, uh, mm hmm It's extraordinary. Well, I'm glad you're here tonight. I just want to make one remark that Herzl covered the second Dreyfus uh, trial, and that was when he really became a Zionist. It's true. He was, he was a, a, a reporter for an Austrian newspaper, for a Viennese newspaper, I forget which one, and um, he was covering the trial. He was there at Rennes in 1898 for the, for the second trial, and he was, and as a Viennese Jew, well, he was extraordinarily cosmopolitan, and he was shocked by the passions that had been aroused by this affair. And it was then that his cosmopolitanism sort of, he shed that, um, as he shed his belief in the capacity of human reason to control our passions. 
and um, that's when he that's the seed for the Yudhishthat for the for for his manifesto for a Jewish state. Absolutely. 